Journeys in 2 Samuel. Here are some cities, and some of these are becoming familiar at this point. There are always more to learn, and some regions also. And 2 Samuel will begin where 1 Samuel ended. David is in the Philistine city of Ziklag. Saul is fighting the Philistines up north. And a messenger brings the news. Saul and Jonathan are dead, and David mourns. Chapter 2, verse 1. After this, David asked the Lord, Should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. Then David asked, Which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. Verse 8. But Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had already gone to Mahanaim with Saul's son Ishbosheth. There he proclaimed Ishbosheth king over Gilead, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, and all the rest of Israel. Abner battles David's commander Joab. Verse 1. That was the beginning of a long war between those who were loyal to Saul and those who were loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger, while Saul's dynasty became weaker and weaker. David becomes a father. There is a feud between Saul's son and Abner the general. David negotiates for the return of his first wife, Saul's daughter, Michael. And Abner visits David on behalf of the tribe of Benjamin. This tribe is right in the middle of the civil war, in more ways than one. Remember that Saul was from this tribe. A century later, during another civil war, Benjamin and Judah will stand alone against their twelve brothers. Abner is seeking peace. Maybe he just thinks that David has a better chance of coming out on top. Whatever his motivation, Abner is assassinated against David's wishes by Joab. Why? Well, in an earlier battle, Abner had killed Joab's brother. David mourns for the general, knowing that God will not reward what Joab has done. Two brothers from Benjamin go north and assassinate Ishbosheth and bring his head to David, and David has the men put to death for their crime. Just as David had earlier put to death that man, the Amalekite, who expected a reward for bringing David Saul's crown. It is a violent age, but David did not gain the throne through intrigue or through assassination. Verse 2, Then all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron and told him, We are your own flesh and blood. So there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel, and they anointed him king of Israel. David was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years in all. He had reigned over Judah from Hebron for seven years and six months, and from Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah for thirty-three years. Jerusalem? David conquers what will thereafter be known as the city of David. And I have to keep reminding myself that Jerusalem was, up to this point, under Jebusite control. If you consider Jerusalem and you think of it as the spiritual center of Israel, you are certainly not alone, but up to this point in history, other sites, Bethel, Shechem, even Hebron, where David had just left, these sites could be considered more significant. Jerusalem has been a player. It was from there that Melchizedek, the priest Melchizedek, came to bless Abraham. And it was on this mountain where Abraham was tested by God. As we acknowledge God's providence behind all these events, we also acknowledge military significance to David's victory. He cannot be the king of a united Israel without a united Israel. In any case, there he is. And the Philistines attack, because that's what they do, and David pushes them back. And it is now safe, David thought to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about this in the previous video. This is Jerusalem. This is where the tabernacle was taken to Nob, where priests allowed David to eat of the showbread. But the Ark is over there in kirjath Jerim. They should be together. They were together in Shiloh, but that's when Eli's wicked sons brought the Ark out against the Philistines, and it was captured. 
It had been returned and was now in storage. David has a vision for united worship in Jerusalem. But when the ark is moved, verse 6, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand and steadied the ark of God. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him dead. And there are many directions we could go with this event. From Exodus 25, we read a description of the construction of the ark. It tells us that the ark should be carried on wood rods inserted through golden rings. From Numbers 4, there's more details about how the ark was to be transferred. Remember, it was carried through the entire wilderness journey. Verse 15, as the camp is to set forward, the sons of Kohath, shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. So it wasn't just the Levites, but only a particular family within the Levite tribe. Only they were allowed to transport the ark, and even they were not allowed to touch it. But was Uzzah killed for showing insufficient reverence? Wait a minute, he was trying to study the ark to make sure it did not fall. Again, there's many directions we could go with this, many questions to ask. Was this ark still on that same cart that the Philistines had placed it on decades earlier? And we will have more to say about this event at the end of this lesson. But in any case, progress towards Jerusalem has stopped. But then the Lord blesses the house where the ark now is. David notices. And the journey is taken up again, this time with the king himself leading the procession, dancing and making sacrifices. And finally, the ark is placed back in its tabernacle. But David has grander plans, a temple, a house for the Lord. The prophet Nathan delivers God's reply. David will not build a house for the Lord. Instead, the Lord will establish David's throne forever. If you only read one chapter from the historical books, I would recommend 2 Samuel 7. Next, more military details. David subdues the surrounding nations, taxes them, and dedicates their silver and gold to the Lord. David shows mercy on the lame son of his old friend Jonathan. And then the Ammonites start trouble, and the Arameans join in and are defeated. David's empire has expanded. Next, more Arameans attack, this time from beyond the Euphrates. Victory for David means expansion for Israel. Combine this with the territories subdued in the south, and David has now made Israel a player on the world stage. But the next part of the story strikes closer to home. Verse 1, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening that David arose from off his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from there he saw a woman bathing. And David sins. He tries to hide his sin, and then he adds the sin of murder to the sin of adultery. David repents, and Bathsheba's child dies. Verse 29, So David gathered the rest of the army and went to Rabbah, and he fought against it and captured it. But David's family troubles are far from over. One of his daughters is outraged by one of his sons. Another son, Absalom, has a plan. He lures the criminal away from the palace, takes revenge, and flees. Joab, with some help, convinces David to allow Absalom to return home. But the son begins to conspire against his father and has himself declared king in Hebron. David has to flee. Some people are loyal to him, others are not. And Absalom enters Jerusalem. What will this usurper do next? He is convinced to attack his father across the Jordan. The plan fails. The old Heartbroken king now returns home and works to restore his kingdom. Joab assassinates another rebellious general, same like Abner before, and then he pursues another rebel all the way to the opposite side of the kingdom. This time, a woman is able to prevent unnecessary bloodshed. 
Not that all the bloodshed has ended. David must atone for a sin committed by Saul against Gibeon. More battles against the Philistines. And David is now old and close to the end of his life. So the book ends with a song of thanksgiving. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my salvation. And a list of David's warriors. A list that ends with Uriah the Hittite. And then another sin. David sends Joab to take a census of the people. Aurora, Gad, Mount Hermon, Dan, Zidon, Tyre, Beersheba, from Gilead to the Negeb. But the census has angered God, and the land is afflicted with a pestilence for three days. The avenging angel halts in Jerusalem, at the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. David buys the land. This will be the site of the temple. So the book ends where it is centered, not with fighting over regions on the map, even though that's what I'm trying to show here, but with the giving of our hearts to God through divine worship. With that, we now return as promised to David, not him killing Goliath, not his sin, but Second Samuel chapter 6. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obedidim the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed all his household. So David brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. Let us now hold that text next to portions of Luke chapter 1. Mary arose and went into the hill country into a city of Judah, and when Elizabeth heard Mary's salutation, the babe leapt in her womb. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. How is this that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary abode with her about three months.